Hello everyone. Okay, so continuing on, we need to figure out how to take the input from the player. So during the game, the clock's going to be moving along, and during every period of the clock, an LED is going to be lit. And of course, the player has to like hit hit the push button on the correct LED to get the most points. And so we got to know just what LED uh, he's hitting on. And uh, to do that, we're obviously going to have to take the input from a push button, and it's going to be in the form of a pulse, what else. And it's going to have to, of course, start the moment uh, he pushes the button, but it has to end before the next period of the clock cycle. Because if it continues on, then to like over here, then, you know, which LED did he hit it on? Did he hit on this one or the next one? And so that pulse has to end right, right, at, right before the next, uh, the next uh, clock cycle. So before when we did our monostable circuits with a triple five timer, we kind of hardwired the width of this pulse with an RC time constant. But that won't do this time. Uh, for one, our clock, you know, we're, we're going to want to vary the frequency because that's going to, you know, that's going to kind of dictate how, how quickly the game runs. And so we'll want to have different speeds for different levels of the game. And uh, so if that's variable, then this, this, this pulse width can't be hardwired. And also, we actually don't know where, you know, within this, uh, within this cycle, the player's going to hit the button. You know, he could hit it here, he could hit it at the beginning. And so, uh, so this width is always going to be variable. And so an RC time constant is out of the question. So we got to th think of a way to uh, capture the player's input. So if we check out our trusty Art of Electronics textbook and flip it over to the digital section, zoom in right here, and on figure 1075, we have a couple D flip-flops, and uh, it's called Single Pulse Generator. And what does it say? Figure 1075 shows how to make a single glitch-free pulse whose width is equal to one clock cycle. That sounds fairly close to what we want, and I believe we could use this circuit uh, for our player's push button. Okay, so first, let's take a look at the D flip-flop. You know, the D flip-flop is really one of the coolest pieces of logic. It's, uh, it has your input here, the so-called data input, and it has your output Q. And it also gives like the opposite of Q, Q naught. So if this is a one, that's gonna be a zero. So you kind of have two sort of outputs and it has a reset and a preset. And these are kind of like override mechanisms. So if you wanna force this Q to zero, well, you, you bring this guy low. But if you wanna force him to one, well, you then bring this guy low. And if you don't wanna use it at all, we just keep these two high. And it's fed by the clock right here. And so how it works is that whenever the uh, positive uh, pulse of the clock hits the, that upper edge, whatever's in the input gets transferred to the output. And any other time, the output kind of ignores what's in the input. And so to, dem to kind of demonstrate that, I show a little timing diagram here. And so here we have our steady clock rate going. And here I have some random inputs for the D flip-flop. But you notice the Q just kind of sits at zero and kind of ignores them. Uh, and that's because if we look, every time there's a positive edge, you know, the D's low. And so it doesn't change. It just stays low. Until we reach here, the positive edge is when the D is high. And so the Q moves high. And, and that's kind of how the, the D, D flip-flop works. I mean, it's just really simple. Whatever comes in goes out at the positive edge of the clock. Otherwise, it ignores it. But, but this simplicity is like, uh, it, it's so it's so useful in its simplicity. And it's, it's a really useful circuit. And in fact, it's gonna be a, one of the main components for our finite state machine, as we'll be checking out later. And so now, so here's the circuit I've, I've redrawn, kind of, that was in the textbook. And basically your clock is gonna be sitting at low from ground. And then when the player hits the push button, you know, it's gonna strike up high and then it's gonna do its little thing here. And uh, 
to check out the operation of this clock, you know, because there, there's, there's two deep flip flops, there's like a fair amount of stuff going on. I've, uh, I've written out yet another little page here. And so let's get this in the screen and see just what it does. Okay. So our push button is attached right to the first clock input of the first D flip flop. Now the input at the D, it's always tied to five volts. So it's tied high to five volts and the output goes to the input of the second flip flop. And in the second flip flop, the clock signal is gonna be our actual clock signal. So we do tie our clock signal to the second uh, D flip flop. And now if we look at the output of it, it just sits there, that could be useful. That's where we get our synchronized pulse. But the, but the, the knot of the output, the, inver the inversion of the output is fed back around to the reset of the first one. Okay, so then let's look at the uh, let's look at the at the initial state. In the initial state, you know, nothing is happening at the push button. This guy's tied high. The output is low, and uh, the output of the Q2 is low. And since uh, the output of the Q2 is low, well then this one has to be high, and that means the reset, you know, is disabled. And I've and the other three uh, uh, resets and presets, I've, we don't need them, so they just were tied high and, and we could forget about them. So let's move on to when the push, the player strikes the push button. We get a rising edge here, and the high in the input gets pushed to the output. And this output is connected to the input of the second flip-flop. But since there's no rising edge here, the output stays low. And so, uh, the, and so of course, the, this one stays high and there's no reset. And then now let's move to when there is a clock pulse. So now that there's a clock pulse, this high at the input of the second one gets transferred to the output. And at the same time, the knot goes low. And since this goes low, it's gonna reset our output from high to low. And so that's what I've drawn here. And so now the output goes low. And so the input to uh, the second one goes low too. And so these two kind of like happen in a blink of an eye. You know, it's just, all it, all it takes is, it's just a, the time delay for, for the signal to come in and go through these kind of 2D flip-flops. So it's in the nanoseconds. So these two guys happen in a blink of an eye. And all of a sudden we have the output at Q2 go high. And then on the very next clock uh, cycle, the next upper edge of the clock that strikes basically Q2 goes down low, and the knot goes high again, and it resets uh, It resets Q1. Uh, sorry, it doesn't reset, it's already been reset. And then it just, uh, it goes back high, and, and, the, and the reset is disabled. And we basically come back to our first, uh, our first situation here. So we've just done a circle. And I've drawn a little timing diagram of how, of how all this uh, goes down. And so here's our clock moving along. And then once the player hits the push button on this first dotted line, we see Q1 rise up, but nothing happens to Q2. And then on the very next upper edge of the clock, well, our Q1 drops. And so that's, that's exactly what we want, right? When, when the player hits the push button, the Q1 goes up, and on the very next clock cycle, the, uh, the, Q, the Q1 goes down. And what the textbook was talking about, they were actually talking about Q2, where, it, where what it does, it makes a clean pulse that's precisely the width of one clock cycle. But we don't really need this. Uh, we want the Q1 as our output. And so going back to the diagram here, that, that's what we've done. We've taken our Q1 as our output, and the input from the push button goes to the first clock. Now, to build this, there's a chip called the, the 74HC uh, or HCT74. And what that contains is precisely 2D flip-flops with all the presets and resets. So it's, it's exactly what we need. And uh, if we move on to the breadboard. So there it is right there. I have a little push button that's uh, tied to ground.
initially, and then it goes to the 74-74 chip here, that the, the two D flip-flops, and and it's all configured as shown in the diagram. Here's, here's the clock signal coming in. And so I have a bunch of probes hooked up so that we could check it out on the oscilloscope. So uh, let's go check that out. Let's see what happens here. Okay, so here we go. So the push button has been struck. And uh, so the baby blue, which looks white to me, that's the, uh, that's the clock pulse you can see continuing on. The yellow pulse, that's, that's what comes from the push button. But what we want is this uh, is the purple pulse here. That's the output, and you see it, it comes ex it comes up just when the just when the player hits the button, and ends at the very next upper edge of the clock. Oops, sorry. And so we, and also if you can see the little numbers uh, down here, this is the width of our of our output pulse. And this is also the time between the first edge of the player's push button and the first edge of the clock. And, and they should be equal, which they are. So we can just do a few examples of this. And we'll see that the, uh, the pulse can change, but it always starts and ends just where we want to. And uh, so that's good. But as we mentioned, there'll be different uh, Kind of levels to the game so if we speed up our game a bit and then we can see how it goes oh wow so it's a tiny little pulse there but 1.64 still caught so now the game's moving fast ah oh and that was kind of what i was worried about you could see let me zoom in there's two pulses here. And so even though on one push button, we do get uh, two pulses, the problem is that the, our push button is debounced for basically one and a half clock cycles. So it's, it's debounced all the way up to the second uh, clock pulse, this guy. But after, after that second clock pulse, he's no longer debounced. And so if we do get some nastiness like we do here, is it, it could come up as, as two pulses, which precisely it does. And so this is a bit of an issue. And we have to think about how, how we're gonna deal with that. Because, you know, we could just uh, debounce the switch, but we don't wanna debounce it for too long. And, and that's because, you know, maybe the push button, the player wants to do like, like two very quick consecutive pulses. And uh, we don't wanna have, you know, the chip being debounced and say, sorry, no, you've, you've pushed a button too fast. And so we're gonna have to think about how, how we could debounce the switch for just the right amount of time so that it do doesn't interfere with the player's game, but also doesn't produce this kind of double pulse uh, thing going on here. So. Let's think about that. Okay, so we have to fix uh, the little bug that we have in our circuit where we would get two pulses if we hit our push button down in kind of the fast mode in our game. It worked all right at a moderate pace, but when the clock is going really fast, we, because uh, the debouncing could stop working. And so, and so what I did is that I kind of timed myself to see how quickly I could hit this push button uh, in two, two uh, consecutive pushes. And of course, in a, in a kind of controlled manner, so not just like vibrating my finger like crazy. And it, and it turns out that it, it ranges between about 130 to 150 milliseconds, at least for this push button and my fingers. <laughs> so, uh, what we need to do is we have to delay, put a debounce this switch um, for a smaller amount of time than, than 130 milliseconds because, because otherwise you could push it twice, you try to do push it twice and you know, the, the debouncer won't work and you, obviously that's, that's not good. But we, we want to extend it as much as possible too. So 
We want to have it as high as we can, but below this number. And of course, to the rescue is the triple five timer. And it just so happens that it's actually, the, the triple five timer is gonna be in the same configuration as we did the original mono stable uh, uh, circuit uh, before. And so we, we come, we start off here at five volts. We have our little a mega ohm, our little, our large mega ohm resistor. And this is a terrible drawing of a push button here, but that's what it is. And it leads to our capacitor and uh, the other pull-up resistor. And this, and it's this little network that's gonna feed uh, our trigger input uh, at pin two on the triple five. Now, since it's in monostable mode, uh, seven and six are tied together. And, I, and so a 100K and a, a one microfarad cap, that's gonna give us about 110 milliseconds according to their little formula. And the output is going to go to the uh, to our two D flip flops in the seven four HCT seven four chip. Okay, so this this will debounce our, our push button for about one hundred ten milliseconds, which is less than this time here, and it gives us you know a bit of margin, you know in case in case people get really quick. So let's hook it up to the breadboard and uh, test it out, see if it works. So our circuit is hooked up to the oscilloscope, and now let's check out its operation. So we see the clock, and the purple trace is our the output of our push button, and the white trace is the uh, debouncing pulse from the triple five timer. So, so that's the length that our switch is debounced. And you can see it's about 112 milliseconds, so it's very close to the uh, 110 and milliseconds predicted by the equations. So the capacitor is actually half, de it's pretty good in fact, more than half decent for an electro electrolytic capacitor. And then we could try a few, uh, see if we could see any double pulses and it seems to be good. You know, does not seem, none seem to be showing up, which is expected. And we could also just Check out to see if we could get two quick pulses in succession. And we do. And uh, the difference between the two pulses is uh, 142 milliseconds. I have it there. And of course, this number needs to be uh, larger than our 112 milliseconds. Otherwise, uh, it won't get registered. And 123. Wow, that was pretty close. So you might want to adjust this length depending on your push button and how quickly uh, you could push it or your, your players will be able to push it. So we could, you know, put this in half by instead using say a 47 kilo ohm resistor than 100K. So it's something to play around with and uh, figure out kind of what works for you. But it seems to be working and even though we're coming close, it's debounced. Uh, the debouncing is just short enough, at least for this push button. All right, guys. Thanks for watching the video.